Pulled up to the scene in a 65 Bentley, dripped in Brioni, China doll with me, looking like a supermodel, oh what a feeling, 25 years old, 25 million, today's the audition for the Godfather part, my life's already a movie so when do I start, I walk up in Patsy's East 119th Street, Fat Tony Salerno gets a kiss on the cheek, I know my way around, not my first time here, been doing overnight cigarette loans for 10 years, I say hello to Danny Pagano and Tough Tony, Nicky Domino gives me a nod, they all know me, they ask why I'm there so early, I say the part, they say what part? I say the movie, why not? I don't look like Carlo, they all begin laughing 3 p.m. ready for the lights My name is Gianni Russo A.K.A. Carlo The infamous son-in-law from The Godfather I'm now known as the Hollywood Godfather And this is my story Walking with a limp like will I ever run? Once again or is this it? Am I forever done? Living in the hospital was never fun some people were cool, but not everyone. You Welcome, everybody. It's time for another Hollywood Godfather podcast. And tonight we got really an exciting show. I want to introduce my co-host, Pat Picciarelli, my co-writer and my friend. What's how's, happening, Pat? How's everybody doing? Yes, we do have a good show tonight. Let's, let's get right, right into it. But before that, uh, for, if you recall from the last show, those of you who have returned, we had quite a few emails, uh, people saying or uh, complaining that uh, they went to click on old episodes and over 200 shows vanished from our oh. host. And uh, we looked into that. We changed hosts. So if it was on or about May 2nd that you tried to go to an old show, it took us about 24 hours or took the host, the new host, about 24 hours to get all our old shows up on our new platform. So as you hear me speaking this, all the shows are where they're supposed to be, no, no matter what platform you're using. We're on about 20 platforms. So everybody has the shows and are all set to go. Okay, that said, uh, in the last few weeks, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. has announced uh, his candidacy on, on the Democratic platform for uh, President of the United States. So what we feel in an effort to get screen time, uh, he, he will... Uh, stand for interviews and he's come out with a statement saying that the uh, CIA uh, murdered his uncle and he got this directly from his father and he's been on quite a few uh, uh, news outlets saying this without supplying any proof or documentation other than the fact that his father told him this directly so uh, we are very happy to have with us tonight Mark Shaw, who's been with us uh, at least three times. Uh, this may be the fourth time. Uh, and we don't have guests, uh, repeat guests on very often. And Mark always has something valid to say, and it's always an interesting show. And when Mark looked into this, he did his usual superb research and uh, was going to refute uh, RFK's allegation that uh, his father told him that his uh, his uncle JFK was killed by the CIA. So, with that long preamble, uh, welcome to the show, Mark Shaw. Well, thank you uh, so much. And I, I I never wanted to do too much with this with RFK Jr. because he's had other issues, uh, as we all know, with uh, with his uh, uh, you know the things he said in the past and all of that. But when he decided to run for president, I kept kind of watching what he was saying. And unfortunately, you guys, he, he's really trying to rewrite history here. Uh, he, he somehow or another has has decided to I, I think it all has to do with the fact that he's trying to get attention. And the way you get attention from the media, especially on the extreme side, is to come up with revelations uh, that nobody's heard before. And you don't back it up with too much. And frankly, then you don't think anybody is going to be able to refute what you've said. And uh, it's interesting, I wanna give you a little backdrop here because RFK and I have communicated before, RFK Jr. Uh, when uh, there was- oh, I wish, I'm glad you cleared that up. <laughs> yeah, thank you. None of this paranormal stuff on this show. Uh, so anyway, uh, it's been uh, probably, uh, oh, nine months to a year or so ago, he got very upset with Collateral Damage, the book that I wrote that connected the life and times and deaths of JFK, Marilyn Monroe, 
and uh, Dorothy Kilgallen, you know, the famous journalist that I based oh. all my research on. We and extend. We had a, we had what? a show, an extensive show. We sure did. And, on on this our, our show about. And that. he didn't like that at all. And so um, I found out that he was really upset about it. Uh, he told a number of people that he was upset. Uh, th those particular people said, well, have you read the darn book? And he said, no. But and then he yelled at a secretary to get him one. So yeah. he didn't even read the material. But I had obviously implicated him, Gianni, as you know, in, in the in the death of Marilyn Monroe. So he didn't like that at all. So I had his email and I sent him an email and I said, look, you know, I, I know you're upset about this. Why don't you and I go on a program and debate this? And, and I'll do it any place, any time you want to. So I never heard from him at all. And then, you know, I, I published Fighting for Justice, uh, which is my latest book. And in there, I talked about the Warren Commission corruption for the first time with a primary source and all of this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, basically it goes into how the commission was formed and JF, uh, LBJ and, and uh, Hoover, you know, uh, populating the commission with all these Oswald alone people and everything else like that. And so I have a hunch, although I don't know, that he must have read that book. And he was really upset with what I said, because basically in that book and one, I think, two or three before that, I had pointed out all the things that went on with regard to, you know, this is a perfect situation for me because Patrick is a celebrated uh, policeman, detective, all of that. And Gianni, you know, the mafia inside and out. And well, so this is perfect in, in this situation because... Uh, this all goes down to what happened to JFK. And we all know that uh, the 1960 election, Joe Kennedy knew they were going to lose the election unless they won West Virginia and Illinois. So what do they do? They use Frank Sinatra, their their buddy, and they get a hold of uh, Giancana. They get a hold of Marcel, all these guys. And well, say, let me Look. correct you there, too, though. Uh, J Joe Kennedy Sr. met with Frank Costello at the Waldorf Astoria uh -huh. to organize it. There's no way that they would talk to Joe Kennedy if it wasn't the introduction was made by Frank Costello because they were partners during Prohibition. Ah, I, I don't think you've ever them. told me that before, and it really fits in because there's a connection to Dorothy Kilgallen there. But anyway, what happened is those people influenced the, the uh, elections in Illinois and West Virginia, especially with Mayor Daley. In Illinois, and they won. Well, the deal was that Joe would then, uh, you know, the, the Kennedys, when they got in the White House, would leave those guys alone. And uh, what happened? Well, I had a primary source witness who was right there at a breakfast when Joe Kennedy ordered JFK to appoint Bobby Kennedy attorney general. And what did he do? First thing, he went after Carlos Marcello, the uh, uh, New Orleans Don, who was, uh, in fact, uh, it's interesting, I think you know, Gianni, who set up uh, Marcello in New Orleans, and that was Frank Costello. And so I know there's, that. I mean, there's that link in you, there as well. But yeah. You're talking about things that you and I haven't spoke recently. I was at that family barbecue on that Sunday when Bobby came in with all, and arrested him in front of his family. He did it deliberately with the cameras with him. Oh, yeah. He, he loved the cameras, Bobby did. That's, that's why... Bobby Jr. is kind of trying to reinvent Bobby Kennedy. Uh, I know. But the interesting in thing, I was, was. But anyway, I was, we know I that, was, we know that uh, Bobby went after Marcelo, deported him to Guatemala. He almost died down there. And, right. uh, you know, it's interesting because, uh, uh, you know, uh, Gianni, you can't mess around with those mafia guys. I've told a story on other programs that I could tell you how I learned firsthand about that. You can't mess around with those guys. No. Revenge is their middle name if you do. But, you and know, so the interesting thing, I think I think we should share with the audience, Bobby, when they put him in handcuffs in front of his grandchildren and everything, he deliberately came there on a Sunday with the camera crews. Yeah. And Marcelo says, you're a dead man. And he came right over to him with three or four major camera, uh, you know, NBC, CBS. And is you threatening a sitting attorney general? He's, I'm not threatening you. I'm going to kill you. <laughs> well, and he would have. Except and they have it on he, camera. Yeah, but except he was a smart man, because if you kill Bobby Kennedy, what happens? J John Kennedy's going to come after you with everything the government has. So Marcelo says, well, here's what I'll do. I'll eliminate JFK and Bobby will be powerless. And that's exactly what happened. Oh, I know. You look at motive then, and this is where you come in, of course, Patrick, because you know all about that. 
the motive there is to uh, you know, eliminate uh, Bobby Kennedy so that, or JFK, so Bobby will be powerless. Exactly what happens because in the in the fall of 1963, uh, just uh, just before JFK was dead, what 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 was the mindset of Marcello? He knew that RFK was going to come after him again and deport him if he could, but he'd also charged him with racketeering in a New Orleans courtroom. So the motive is really there for what happened. And, and then you go, and, and we'll get to what Bobby said, but let, let's just go then to the fact that JFK is dead. And Bobby Kennedy gets the phone call from J. Edgar Hoover at his Hickory Hill home or whatever. And what is the, and as I, as I sent in the materials to you, what exactly did Bobby Kennedy say at that particular time? Well, to his, uh, his uh, press secretary, Ed Guthman, there's so much bitterness. I thought they would get one of us, but Jack, after all that we'd been through, I never thought it would happen. I thought it would be me. There's so much business and hatred. And then he mentioned they and not just he. Then he got on Charlie Rose's program at one particular point and went all through this, RFK Jr. did, and said that he knew uh, you know, when Rose asked if he believed that RFK, who had it, it given a speech that branded Marcello a malignant threat to society, felt some sense of guilt because he thought there may have been a link between the very aggressive efforts, efforts against or, organized crime. And RFK said that he knew that his father had, had, had supposedly talked about the fact that there was an inventory of mafia leaders the government had been investigating, and that's what R why RFK thought it was is the mafia. The presidential confidant, Ken O'Donnell. O'Donnell, I mentioned the syndicate, the possibility of the, of the mob. I certainly thought RFK believed the mob had been involved. He suspected Carlos Marcello, the New Orleans capo to whom Jack Ruby had ties. He kept saying they should have killed me. So there's two or three of those. Then we go to these are all primary source situations. How about this one? Richard Goodwin, the husband of uh, the, the noted historian Dor Doris Kearns Goodwin, believed his brother was killed by the guy from New Orleans, meaning Marcello. And on even Bobby Kennedy Jr. on Charlie Rose's program said, Dad spent a year of trying to come to grips with, grips with my uncle's death, reading the work of Greek philosophers, Catholic scholars, Henry David Thoreau, poets and others trying to figure out the existential implication of why a just God would allow injustice to happen like this. To John McCone, the CIA director, in an oral history, McCone said RFK wanted to know what we knew about it and whether it had been Cuban or Russian hit or whatever. He even asked me if the CIA could have done it. I mentioned the mob, the mob but RFK didn't want to know about it. I know he suspected the mob. I know he suspected Marcello. To National Democratic Chairman, Committee Chairman Lawrence O'Brien, uh, he should have, uh, uh, Oswald uh, was involved. He should have shot me, not uh, Jack. I'm the one they were out to get, my enemies. Joan Braden, the wife of uh, CIA operative Tom Br Braden. Braden asked her husband, because of CIA experience, if he might have had the idea of who was behind Jack's assassination. Bobby suspected such mafia figures as Carlos Marcello. And then uh, the one that really comes to mind is, is this New York Times Magazine editor and, and, and in chief and author, Edward Klein. Bobby, who could never suspect, never get rid of the suspicions that his en enemies had retaliated against him by killing his brother, began reading Greek tragedies for consolation. So these are all people that Bobby Kennedy was close to, and this was what he was saying, and he was right. You know, Bill Alexander, the the uh, uh, the prosecutor, uh, along with uh, the other, uh, the main one uh, of, of of Jack Ruby, told me in an interview. Well, you know, Bobby had many more enemies than JFK did, and so I I surmise with all of this information that people get the wrong idea here. They look at why JFK was assassinated instead of why Bobby Kennedy wasn't. And the reason he wasn't is because, you know, Marcella was smart enough to know that if you get rid of Bobby Kennedy, Jack Kennedy would come up with everything you have to say. Well, this is the this is the statement that Bobby Kennedy Jr. made last week. He got on Sean Hannity and all of that. And he just started screaming. One of the things he said is, you know, people are going to start listening to me about this. 
And that's what you do when you're a presidential candidate. You want people to pay attention to you. So right. somehow or another, he's decided by bringing back all this information that we can kind of go through point by point that that there's really no basis for it. But what you do, as you guys know, and I've seen this in all the books about the JFK assassination, if you are an Oswald alone theorist, then you don't touch Dorothy Kilgallen because Dorothy Kilgallen looked at this as a mafia hit. She talked to Jack Ruby at the trial. She interviewed him. She went to New Orleans after she talked to Ruby. She focused on Marcello, not Lee Harvey Oswald. And she wrote all those columns and, and so on and so forth. But if you're an author and you're writing a book about the Oswald alone theory, you're not going to go ahead and use Dorothy Kilgallen's uh, information. And that's exactly what Bobby Kennedy did here. He left out all the things that I said and instead, he wants the American people to believe that at nine years old, nine years old, I was I was hoping to bring that up because really he said his father all these told him was going on. No, but not only that, he made a statement that his father told him. What father is going to confide in a nine-year-old <laughs> to say this about? You know, this is talking about world problems and presidents and assassinations of the, the top people of the world. My, he said, my, father's up my nine-year-old first son instinct, and say this. this my crazy. father's first instinct was it was it the CIA. It's never happened. It no. just never happened. So I guess what what I'm interested in, and and you know, I commend Bobby for for a couple things: his civil rights that he was involved in. He he was uh, very uh, helpful with regard to the missile crisis. But you know, uh, with with this kind of situation, he's kind of bringing up the dead. And, and putting words in their mouth. And that really concerns me because that's distortions of history. And so many people, unfortunately, will listen to Robert Kennedy Jr., although this whole thing with the vaccinations and the Holocaust and everything, I think, have damaged that reputation. And they'll, they'll think, yeah, boy, the CIA did this. Well, there's just, he says there's millions of, uh, of, 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 of people, uh, you know, that in these CIA files who, who, Kind of boast of of handling the uh, um, you know the uh, the death of of JFK. Well, for one thing, CIA people are not going to boast about boast doing about anything. anything. Hello, that's for sure. And he talks about you know the the fact that it was my father's first instinct that the agency killed his brother killed his brother. Well, come on, Bobby Junior, that just didn't happen. And I'll tell you what I'm going to do after we're done. I'm going to send him another email, if it's okay with you guys. And Please. I'm going to say, I was on the program with, with Gianni and Patrick. I want you to come on there with me. And we'll talk about this, debate it if you want to, uh, get a fair shake. Let's, let's, let's get to the bottom of all this. And I want to hear your proof in terms of what happened. And I want to, you, I want to hear you denounce all of these close friends of your father's who give a completely different version of what happened here. You know, he's perfectly well aware. I mean, this kid, this kid, he's an old man now. He's been dealing with the media all his life, and he knows how to manipulate them. So no mm -hmm. matter what he says, no one's going to call him on it. That's that's one reason that... that well, that, that's the kind of media we have now. Yeah, of course. No, you know, anybody. He's, he's, Trump proved that. Yeah, he, well, he's hot. And, you know, he's the first declared uh, candidate. And, and he's a Kennedy, you know, Camelot's coming back. People are interested in this and they're going to throw him softball questions. But also, I think one of his motivations are, if you vote for me, I will get rid of all this corruption in government. There's a perfect example that uh, he's trying to convince the, the voting public. These allegations are true. And all through recent history, uh, everybody has a negative opinion about the CIA. Some of the uh, things right. said about the CIA are, are valid. Uh, the things that they've done in the past. We all learn by our mistakes. Now, this is an intelligence organization. You're going to make boo-boos. It happens. But for him to say this, it's something else that can be part of his platform. We're going to get rid of this corruption once and for all. And if he gets the nomination, which I really doubt, unless Biden gets hit by a truck or he realizes he can't, uh, he can't run again, uh, this is going to be part of his platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, good point. And the other thing that he's doing here, in my opinion, he's trying to find any other issue that he can bring up that will divert people away from the whole catastrophe with regard to the what he did with regard to the vaccinations, the Holocaust, all of that kind of thing. 
And I think that's what he'll continue to to do. Uh, it, it's really unfortunate because uh, yeah, I used to have a lot of respect for RFK Jr. when he was the environmentalist and all that other kind of thing. You know, have you have you seen what the Kennedy family thinks of him running for office? They don't want yeah. him to run for office. <laughs> yeah, they, are they, don't, they don't believe any of this bull. I'm telling you, he says there are millions of pages of documents, CIA documents of transcript of recorded conversations. There are confessions of people who are directly involved in the plot or the planning of the plot who were peripher peripheral to the plot. There's a 60 year cover up. Well, this was said in front of Sean Hannity, who then, of course, never follows up to ask him. Well, let's let's see some of those uh, uh, documentation about the confessions and things like that. The other thing that's interesting here, I don't want to forget uh, the new book, Fighting for Justice, is important because in the latter part of that that book, I have that eyewitness that we talked about before, Morris Wolf, who was a legislative assistant to Senator John Sherman Cooper, who was on the Warren Commission. And as you remember, he called me one day. He wanted to trust me with the information. And he talked about Cooper. He went to the hearings with him. He had worked for Bobby Kennedy before uh, Morris Wolf had and all of that and told me about the corruption that LBJ and Hoover were were uh, manipulating the commission. They, 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 they only chose people they believed that could work on uh, would, would focus on Oswald alone. Uh, there's corruption and I don't know why uh, all these kinds of things that he told me. But one of the other things that we found out there was that when that commission was operating, they used uh, Robert Katzenbach, who was the assistant attorney general when Bobby, you know, went off to 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 uh, cry about uh, his his uh, brother's death and, and get into all these books, the Bible, everything else. They used Katzenbach to keep the Warren Commission from looking into Joe Kennedy's fixing the 60 election mm -hmm. and into Bobby Kennedy's involvement with Marilyn Monroe. I mean, that's exactly what they use Katzenbach for. And so there's that that uh, uh, connection to the Warren Commission where Bobby Kennedy, you know, was was, a, was was trying to change history there with regard to what have occurred. And now Bobby Kennedy is basically following in, in his steps. And for a what presidential candidate to do that, uh, I'm sorry, I, I just couldn't remain silent about this. No, but the, I'm glad you didn't. But, you know, as we all know now, also with the Mal Monroe special on Netflix this summer, they proved that Bobby, who said he wasn't even in the state, and that's how naive he was, that he can be in a, a state of California and say he wasn't there. The police department, everybody knew, knew where he was. They admitted he was in the house for four and a half hours before they took the body out. <laughs> What's well, you saying about that? Yeah, I get I crit very much criticized for Bobby Kennedy. He was in San Francisco. He could have never been down in L.A. Well, we've got a, we've got a, a primary source again, and you guys know, and and you're like this too. You want to hear it from somebody who was there. Dorothy Kilgallen was at the JFK assassination uh, in Dallas. She when when it, after it happened, she was at the trial. She interviewed Ruby. Well, you got a. Uh, I mean, these kind of uh, this kind of evidence that I get is is amazing because I never know where it comes from. Fellow gets a hold of me, said, "Hey, Mark, check it out." But uh, at the 20th Century Fox Studios, they had a log to to uh, uh, to uh, document when helicopters came there, and on the day that Marilyn Monroe died, there is a document there that shows that Peter Lawford and Bobby Kennedy arrived at the 20th Century Fox studios. And then there's what you talked about. There's a Beverly Hills policeman who stops them later on in the day in the limousine. Yeah, pull them I'm over. telling you, I'm telling you right now, people say I'm crazy. That that couldn't have happened. Those people must have been lying. They'll probably listen to this broadcast and say, Mark, well, all of those friends of of Bobby Kennedy, who, who basically say that he told him it was the mafia, he told him it was Marcella. You're full of beans. You know, I'll, I'll get that response. Because sometimes people do not want to know the truth. They no, want they to don't. go ahead and believe somebody like Bobby Kennedy Jr. here. Well, uh, I tell you, it, uh, extend that invitation to RFK Jr. We would love to have you guys on the show. Oh, my we'll God. just sit God. back and you guys can go at it. And I promise I'll, I'll even dress up. I won't wear just the baseball. <laughs> I know. Nobody will recognize you. You need, you need that hat. You need that hat. And I'll wear that suit. But I'll give it a try and I'll let you know exactly what happens. In fact, I'm going to send you an email. If, is it OK if I uh, copy you both on it? Please. Yes. Right? Just Please. so he knows that I'm not, uh, you know, yelling at the wind here because uh, it, it's just unfortunate. And uh, 
like, like you said, Johnny hadn't thought about it, but he's not being called out about this. There was an article in the New York Post uh, summarizing what he said in Hannity. No, nobody's, nobody's disputing all of that kind of thing. He's just getting away with it. Well, the thing is that, you know, I, unfortunately, it's not like, you know, I'm, I'm 80 years old. The, the news, you used to tune in to Edward R. Marlin and all these other people, and you it was the gospel truth. They re, they researched it. They didn't go on air telling myths and stories and and bull like a kid like this who's just grandstanding to get recognized, and they're letting him go. And yeah. it's going to be another fiasco in four years from now. Or two years it's, from now. It, you know, it's it's who's going to get the hot story first? Uh, yes. Uh, uh, Mark, can, can I suggest this? I don't even know if it's feasible or you even want to do it. Uh, approach Sean Hannity. Say you, you want to give an opposing view. Mm -hmm. oh, look, all he can okay. say is no. I will. I will do it for sure. Absolutely. Well, I, 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 let's go. Let's go to Bobby Jr. first. If he turns him down, I'd go to Sean as a second. Okay. Guy. Okay. Don't you think? Okay, can we, uh, Johnny, can we take a break here? Yeah, please. We'll be right back. We're going to make a few dollars. Don't go anywhere. We know where you are. Hi, this is Patrick from the Hollywood Godfather podcast. As the podcast grows, Gianni and I have decided to fill the slot that Megan vacated last year. To get the best possible person, we have created an application process for those interested in this internship position. Requirements. Female. At least 21 years old be able to think quickly as we are unscripted, and be well read in the events of the day. While our show is organized crime oriented, expertise in this area is not necessary, but the ability to ask questions on a wide variety of subjects is, as our guests also include people from all areas of the entertainment industry, actors, writers, etc. You'll also be required to read the questions on air from our listeners. We broadcast once a week for about an hour. All shows are pre-recorded at various times to accommodate our schedules, as well as our guests' schedules. A decent speaking voice is important. To that end, all applicants are required to submit a video to Patrick at HollywoodGodfatherPodcast.com. The video will have you reading the first page from our novel, The Sixth Family in Your Natural Voice. The application process will be open from May 1st to July 1st this year. If Gianni and I can't decide among several applicants, we'll have those applicants join us on a show separately to see how they acclimate. Ours is a laid-back show, no pressure. We're a family who wishes to expand. All right, we're back with our good friend, Mark Shaw. Always a great show with you, Mark. Thank you so much. Well, you're welcome. The other thing that's interesting here, I don't know if we ever talked about this. You know, I knew Melvin Belli, who uh, was Jack Ruby's attorney. I practiced law in his building in the 80s. I wrote a biography and everything of him. You know, there's a connection into Marcello that a lot of people don't know about. And that is that uh, um, Melvin Belli's, one of his main clients was Mickey Cohen, the uh, I know all about that. gangster <laughs> and everything else. All right. Well, they were, they were, you know, that was his main client. And then you've got the, uh, uh, the connection between uh, um, Marcello and, uh, and Mickey Cohen. In fact, when Mickey Cohen was finally released from prison in Atlanta, first place he went was to to Marcello's office in New Orleans to borrow some money. So there's that yeah. connection. And, and bring it, the reason I bring it up is because uh, all at once, again, this evidence that came to me, and I think Dorothy Kilgallen sends, sends some of it to me, bless her heart. Um, I found out that when uh, Belli was having lunch at Fisherman's Wharf in San Francisco with a friend, and a waiter came up and said, well, you won't believe it. A guy named Ruby just shot Oswald. And this witness, who I, I, I know about and a very reliable lawyer there and everything, said, Ruby said, or uh, Belli said, well, now I'll have to represent Ruby, which means that, that I believe Belli was kind of on call with his Las Vegas mafia, mafia friends. Well, of course to be he was. Ready to I come mean... to the rescue and represent Ruby and then have two objectives one, never let him testify, and second, make him look crazy. And that's exactly what happened. So you've you've buttoned up Oswald, you button up Ruby, and you know that's the way the mafia works. I mean, there's yeah, no. And guess who there. else they buttoned up? I left one guy's name out that they buttoned up. Who's that? Johnny Roselli. Well, I, I don't want to talk about him because I always see the image of how he died. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah, in a barrel. <laughs> yeah. With all the body parts, right? Oh my God, Patrick, aren't you scared to think about that image that that could happen to you if you're not careful? 
I am armed to the teeth. <laughs> Let them come. Besides that, where, where Pat lives, you can never find him. He's in a witness exactly. program. Yeah, if you can find me, yeah, we'll talk. <laughs> and, and and the good news, there's no bay next to his house, so he's not going to be floating in a fifty-gallon drum. Yeah. What, what do you think about Robert, what do you think about Roselli uh, Gianni? Oh, I know all, everything about Johnny Roselli. In fact, uh, uh, crazy as it may be, I met Johnny in Chicago. Then they sent him out to be with Mickey. When Mickey took over uh, Drager, Drager was the boss. Then Mickey oh, Cohen yeah, took over. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm not. Gonna, you're going back into my life now. That's 16, 17, 18 years old. I'm around these guys because of Costello. Yeah. And during that whole nomination, everybody was together on the weekends in Vegas mm. with John, with John Senator John F. Kennedy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It was it was crazy times. And sure, John, Johnny Roselli. I mean, basically. I saw this is this is a piece of history. He was at the Hollywood racetrack with a guy, and I saw him. I used to meet him there a lot. And he and I said, "Who's the guy?" He said, and he me he mentions the guy's name. I can never remember it until he shot Jack Kennedy, mm -hmm. Sirhan, Sirhan. You mean Bobby they Kennedy? Bobby Kennedy, yeah, yeah, Bobby Kennedy. Yeah. They they were babysitting this guy. Yeah, and, and supposedly he was hypnotized, and they convinced him. That if if Bobby gets in, Israel is going to you know annihilate Palestine, and that's how they got this kid. I mean, this is I mean, this story goes on and on and can on. I, can I backtrack on that and show how that works in with Marcelo? Yeah, please. Um, well, you know, I've looked into this, and and that that uh, that the guy you're talking about, who, which turns out to be it looks like Oswald was um, uh, a horse groomer at uh, Hollywood race uh, racetrack, the park, uh, the uh, racetrack. And right. that was controlled in L.A. in many ways by Mickey Cohen. Oh, it definitely was. Back, and no, Mickey, Cohen, <laughs> Mickey Cohen, okay, Mickey Cohen is very tight, as I said, with Marcello. I got a, uh, the last time the documents came out from the government, I got a, uh, uh, a government document, FBI document about Marcello's worst in 1968 if you think he was wealthy in 63 in 68 he had all this land he has bought he had bought a billion dollar empire and everything so all at once just think about this bobby kennedy announces for president and marcello being a smart guy again thinks to himself wait a second if bobby kennedy becomes president what's the first thing he's going to do he knows I'm the one who orchestrated his brother's death. He's going to come after me. So I don't right. think it's speculating very much at all to believe that Marcelo may have been involved with Cohen and this guy at the at the Hollywood racetrack. And so what's the next thing that happened? Bang, Bobby Kennedy's dead. No, I mean, it's, it's a situation that it goes deeper than that because New York had a say. Chicago had to say mm -hmm. this was the syndicate. There was there was a, a committee of six major people, even New Orleans. I mean, even uh, Kansas City, mm -hmm. the Savellas. I know because I was I was just a little kid running around. Don't forget, I'm I'm now we're talking about 62, 63. Mm -hmm. I, I'm twenty years old. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I was a confidant, Patrick, and they knew that. Patrick, maybe I should look into Gianni's life. You think is that my next book, investigating? You know, I'm thinking about writing a book about Gianni's life. What do you think? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Good idea? Yeah. Now, here's the problem, though. Uh, <laughs> everything that you write is going to be true, but is anybody going to believe it's true because it's going to sound like fiction? They, 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 yeah, well, nobody could live a life opinion. like that, right? Uh, well, that's the, that's the one thing about uh, the, the publishing industry. They vet what you ate for breakfast five years ago. <laughs> I mean, they uh, we had so much trouble that we couldn't make this attorney because uh, for, for people who don't know what what uh, what vetting is. Uh, uh, well, first of all, the, uh, we, we jumped around so much. We're talking about now our best-selling book that's out for three years called Hollywood Godfather, uh -huh. where a lot of this was in it. Uh -huh. And our St. Martin's Press, their lawyers had to bet it and find out that this is the truth because they'd be held liable. Sure. And people don't realize it. You know that, Mark, but well, our listeners don't know that. So you know, and even even trying to explain to these with this uh, one attorney, you're assigned an attorney, one. Mm 
Mm-hmm. And he goes over everything in the book, particularly about people who are still living or incidents that 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 happened. And we had such a heart that we sailed through this. I mean, they they uh, documented everything. When we came to the end, when Gianni had to flee the country uh, because his life was threatened. And I don't want to go into it. People who haven't read the book. There's a handful of you out there. Uh, you, you, you can read about it. But to explain to him, and this is an educated man. I mean, the guy graduated law school. How the mob works, how the the the, the intimidation factor mm-hmm. is so important in uh, in in mob life. This is how they they flourish. They threaten. Mm-hmm. This guy, this attorney, could not grasp that. He said, "Well, why didn't Johnny just come back?" No. I said, "They were going to kill his family." <laughs> he said, "Well, how could they do that?" I said, "With a gun." <laughs> you know, absolutely. You that? And it took us literally two weeks to explain to him that this this is how it works. And it did, by the way, this was the simplest part of the book to follow. If you're just reading it, there isn't anything to say, well, gee, I don't know, could this have happened? Obviously it happened because he was overseas for, for two years, right, Johnny? Yeah. yeah. And it was, it was so easy to check on. Uh, but this guy didn't understand the part where people actually do this stuff. You know, that they could actually threaten families and they're involved in, in uh, $50 million lawsuits and they want to right. steal all the money. They couldn't get it. The point is here, when they vet, when a publisher vets, they're very, uh, uh, they, 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 they don't want to take any chances on getting sued. Mm-hmm. So they will turn over every single rock and ask about every single name. And they're, they're very... Uh, uh, very picky about that. I, and I can give you examples, but it would require another show. I've, I've done several books. They ask about the silliest things. Well, they do. Uh, they do. And, and you know, I've written now, what, six books touching on the JFK assassination. The only one that w- that didn't really get vetted too much was the Melvin Belli book, because that was really, I, I knew him. Then the point right. of the patriarch about the 60 election and Joe Kennedy. Then the reporter who knew too much about Dorothy. Then uh, denial of justice that had the trial transcripts in it. Then collateral damage that connected Marilyn, Dorothy, and, and uh, JFK, and then um, the most recent fighting for justice that exposed all this about the Warren Commission. With the attorney at the publishing company, I mean, I felt like finally that I knew this guy uh, better than my brother. I mean, <laughs> you, you 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 hear these things. I mean, how could this have happened? How could this have happened? You know, and things like that. And and footnotes. I, I hate footnotes, but you know, I'm very careful. I mean, all of these. Um, all of these um, accounts that I uh, that I read before, you know, I, I I can substantiate that those things happened because you know I was very careful with my research. You know, the part about Gianni that always gives me a chill is when he's at Mosca's restaurant in New Orleans and he's giving money to uh, I believe it is giving money to Marcelo, and then he notices a guy get, coming out of the bathroom. And and then he, you know, thinks about that. Okay, just fine. Then he's on the ship and he That's sees right. on the television newspaper. <laughs> the JFK assassination. And here's that guy that he saw come out of the bathroom. I, I just got a chill thinking that's just fascinating. But, you know, a lot of people would think, oh, really? Did that happen? Well, I think it's just like with the novel that you guys wrote. Um, those Those images in there, you're very good writers. And the images in there come... Uh, out so strong. Uh, and I think that has a lot to do with believability in a book, don't you? Oh, oh absolutely. God, yeah. uh, uh, you, you have to d- develop the characters enough so the reader believes what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And Pat's um, brilliant at that. I mean, yeah, what he's done. Uh, uh, thank God. Yeah, we had, a, we had a lot more leeway with the Sixth Family, which is the name of the novel you refer to. Yeah. Uh, as I say, uh, as we say at, at, at the beginning of the book, what you could possibly call a disclaimer, this is a work of nonfiction. Uh, this, rather, this is a work of, uh, of uh, fiction, mm-hmm. except for the parts that are true. <laughs> so let everybody else figure it out. But you have so much leeway that you can do whatever. Oh, fiction is a lot of fun. I'm working on something. That's it. We have so much fun all the that. time if you want to. It's great. Huh. Yeah, we, we had so much fun writing that. Sure. Uh, but uh, you know you don't have to worry about attorneys with fiction. <laughs> so, are you serious about writing a biography of, of of Gianni at all? Well, we did the memoir. I mean, that, I know, uh, but is there and and we we hit the highlights. 
Yeah, well, let's get deeper you know, into it then. Let's get deeper into okay. that. I tell you, since then, you know, funny you should bring that up. Uh, since then, you know, we talk four or five times a week for the last five, six years. Uh-huh. And he's, he's, t- he's still telling me things. And I said, oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. I said, why didn't you mention this? <laughs> yeah, but just so much. And there definitely is another memoir here. Yeah. You know, I mean, people write uh, trilogies when it comes to memoirs. Sure, sure. I, I, I mean, uh, he definitely has another uh, me- memoir in him. But we wanted to go the, the, the fiction route. Yeah. Uh, the, the plan is to put out a book a year. Uh-huh. And then we'll see how that goes. Yeah, it's all going to be based on sales. Yeah, I understand. Well, Mark, uh, being that we brought up Mickey Cohen, I got to tell you a classic story. Yeah. Now we all. I mean, this guy was ruthless. I had to go to see Mickey Cohen, and I called him. I said, "Can I see you?" He said, all right, "Meet me tonight. I'm going to be with some people. Come on by. They all know you." So I get there and I said, "Mickey, I got to talk to you." So I know. Sit down there, friends. I said, "No, no, I got to tell you this privately." So he thought I had a message for Costello. So we go on another table, right next to our table. And he said, what's so important? I said, well, I got to tell you, your daughter's pregnant. He said, what? What? And he looked at me. He said, and why are you telling me? And then he looked, <laughs> yeah, and then right. he looked at me. He says, you're the father? Now, I didn't know whether the guy was going to cut my head off oh, or what. Oh, my gosh. Yes. Guess what he said to me? He says, you plan on having a baby? I said, if she wants it, I'll have the baby. Is you got to do me one favor. I said, whatever you want. Now, thank God he's letting me live. <laughs> he, he said, if you have a son, you got to raise him Jewish. Huh? And the other favor you got to do is don't marry her. I said, what? He says, her mother's spoiled to the death. Your child drive you crazy. I don't wish her on anybody. I couldn't <laughs> believe it. <laughs> Jeez. We do the bar mitzvah in, in Vegas. Uh, I'm I'm sitting next to him. We got the yarmulke on the shawls. There's no way his his daughter wanted to name our son Gianni Russo. So in the shul, everybody's there because it's Mickey Cohen's grandson. <laughs> and they're going, la-ba-dee, la-ba-dee. and when it comes to the name, they can't translate in Hebrew. They said Johnny Russo. Well, the first time it happened, even Don Rickles chuckled. Oh. Mickey just turned around, said nothing. The room went silent. Sure. They, met, they mentioned my name 15 more times. Nobody said a thing. It was like amazing. This guy was, I mean, just for our audience to realize it, look up this man. This man ruled. Mm-hmm. Ruled. Mm-hmm. He did. And, and treacherous man, too. Yeah. He finally, you know, he finally ended up in Alcatraz. Oh, I know. <laughs> uh, and Belli, you know, represented him there and everything. But, uh, yeah, he, some of these guys are big. You know, back then, you know, you know this, uh, Gianni, uh, and, and I've read that, you know, with Dorothy and everything. A lot of these guys, I mean, she she was very close friends with Frank Costello. And they were oh, yeah. Giant I saw her so many times at the Copa. He gave her a diamond necklace and all these other kind of things. So mafia people back then were looked upon as celebrities. You know, in you know ways. And there's a thread. I don't know if I, I share this with you. The thread with Dorothy Kilgallen myself costello was a guy called mark shaw mark shaw when i was at lily dashay because i had to go oh, mark to sinclair. School. mark sinclair mark sinclair yeah. rather. i'm not talking to you mark shaw That's mark right. sinclair they came there because his partner at that time was kenneth mm-hmm. and, and mark sinclair was the head colorist right. and I think that Costello said, get that kid out of there. They hired me as a shampoo boy at Lily Dashay. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. as you know, years later, Mark Sinclair found Dorothy Kilgallen dead in the building. Did you know that, Pat? Yeah. He was the I, one who oh. found the body. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's right. And I found, in fact, I'll send it to you if I can find it, a New York Times article about Mark Sinclair. He had really become famous. Oh my God! Clairol, he was the head colorist. For yeah, Clairol. and and all these, uh, you know, he got he got Dorothy's uh, hair already uh, to go meet Cl- Queen Elizabeth. I mean, he did all these different kinds of things. He was he was quite a celebrity. And well, he was in her house every day. That's why he was there that morning absolutely. to do her hair. And he's, hair he's and the makeup. one that fixed her hair for what's my line the night she died and all of that. That's yeah. I remember that. Yes, that was you know that was a big deal uh, back then and everything like that. So yeah, interesting. Oh, yeah. Interesting. So, uh, 
Mark, what are you doing now? You're always doing something. <laughs> well, you know, I wasn't going to do much else with any of this uh, with regard to to RFK Jr. As long as it was just RFK Jr., but now he's the presidential candidate. So um, I'm going to do as much as I can to try to let people know that there's another version of what happened here. I just looked on my paper. Uh, RFK's call was to Harry Ruiz, one of the Cuban Bay, Bay of Pigs leaders who remained very close to our Kennedy and so on and so forth. You know, this is this is a nine year old guy remembering this kind of thing. I mean, the audacity for him to be know, putting all of so this out ridiculous. there. So to answer it's your funny. question, um, I've considered looking into there have been a lot of books written about uh, the Kennedys and Robert Jr. Robert and Robert, uh, you know, Robert JFK, all of them. But uh, I found an FBI file uh, that I don't think anybody's ever seen on Bobby Kennedy. And uh, I'm going to get away a little bit this next week and uh, in fact, Senior, uh, take some time. But I'm going to take a look at that closely and see if there's enough in there. I don't want to write a book that has too much information that's out there. But I feel like now I've almost kind of got an obligation to do something uh, to to show, especially with RFK, that a lot of all this information that he's bringing out is just fabricated, under, uh, you know, unfortunately. So uh, I'll see what happens. But uh, I want to clarify one thing, though. The FBI file is on the father, not the kid. Yeah, it's on the father. Yeah. Did I say it wrong? Father. Yeah. Yeah. No, you said RFK. We don't know. We're talking junior or senior. So that's why I just want yeah, to. It's, it's, uh, it's Bobby senior. Kennedy. And uh, it came to me from an interesting source. And so I, I've yet to go through it. It's about this thick, about as thick as the uh, Jack Ruby uh, trial testimony was when I got it. And that took me a long time to go through. But um, anyway, I, I feel like I might do something with it. Uh, I'll see. But uh, it's, it's always so much fun to come on you guys program. And I appreciate you're doing this because you know, no, please. I, 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 I don't believe anybody else is permitting uh, opposite points of view with regard to what RFK is, uh, Jr. is saying. And so hopefully some of the people who watch this, uh, you know, they can get in touch with me at markshawbooks.com, uh, m, uh, mshawin at Yahoo. I answer all the emails and everything. You can get upset with me, whatever you want to do. But the next thing I'm going to do, and I'll probably do it uh, tomorrow or Monday, I'm going to send that email uh, to RFK uh, Jr., and I'll let you know what happens there. Yeah, you will have a platform here. Well, thank you. No, thank you. Whenever you want, believe me. Well, that's very Whenever nice. You, you guys are good. Okay, Mark, I love you. No, thank you so much. Great. And, uh, you'll always have a home here, Mark. Thank you. All right. Thank okay. you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. You too. Bye. And that was that. I'll be back. Thank you for tuning no in to the Hollywood Godfather podcast. You can contact Gianni Russo or Patrick Picciarelli with your questions and comments through the contact section of our website, hollywoodgodfatherpodcast.com, which is where you can also subscribe to our weekly newsletter. You can also call and leave us a message at 646-776-3038. Remember to follow us on Instagram at Hollywood Godfather and on Facebook, as well as leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. We'd like to know what you like about what we're doing, what you'd like to hear in the future, and anything else you might suggest to improve our podcast. Most importantly, hit the subscribe button. We'll be back next week with stories of the mob and Hollywood, as well as answers to your messages. Good night. My kids still can't believe I sat with a saint. My life's like scenes out of a movie. I'm the Hollywood godfather, truly. I got stories with them all. You know, celebrities, world leaders, icons. Who knows what's next for me? I'll never get too old to have a little fun. Come on, I'm Gianni Russo. A genuine one of a kind. What a ride it's been, this life of mine. And I ain't done yet. I'll be back until next time. And that was that. When I was seventeen. It was a very good year It was a very good year For small town girls And soft summer nights 
We'd hide from the light on the village green when I was seventeen. I didn't mind waiting. 